Miss Go Electric here, and I'm in the city of Detroit today to talk to Trevor Paul, who is the Chief Mobility Officer. He's actually in charge of a lot of things mobility here in the state, so I'm really excited to get an opportunity to talk to him a little bit more about what is happening here. So can you tell me about how you got to this role, the Chief Mobility yeah. Officer, and what kind of problems you're trying to solve here for that? Sure. So I've been in government uh, about a decade, and so I've worked now across two governors, two administrations, and um, I really started down this path with Governor Snyder and, and that administration. I became sort of the, the program creator uh, for industry. So when Governor Snyder wanted a certain economic outcome, say for supply chain or international trade, I'd be asked to build a program around that. Um, and so back in 2017, he asked me to focus on mobility and Planet M was the brand that they wanted to fly the flag for. Uh, and so we created what I think is a pretty compelling set of grant programs and events to connect startups and automakers, basically traditional manufacturing to emerging tech. And then when Governor Whitmer took office, um, she really liked what we were doing and wanted to widen the scope. And so she created uh, the chief mobility officer role um, as well as an Office of Future Mobility and Electrification, which didn't only focus on like industry matchmaking, but also focused on charging infrastructure, workforce, uh, the intersection with climate solutions, transit, um, even cybersecurity. And, and so now our office and, and my role really do, I mean, a, a lot of various things. So everyone wants to talk about battery electric as they should, but our office also, you know, is, is the torch bearer for autonomous vehicles, the future of rail, the future of trucks, the future of maritime, the future of air mobility. The list goes on and on. That brings me to another point is that there are a lot of companies that are starting to invest here in the state of Michigan that mm -hmm. revolve around the business of not only automotive but specifically electrification. So more recently I heard there was investment from our next energy with the yeah. battery facility here uh, via motors uh, in Auburn Hills and flow charging. Yeah. Um, so are there, are there any more uh, companies that you want to talk there's about? More in the pipeline, there's more in the pipeline, that's for sure. Uh, the pipeline too, good. I'm not, not going to break any news today because there's obviously sensitivity around around the deals that we're still working on. but. Um, those are those are three signature wins. Um, you know, I, I, RNX Energy, for example, they, they, what they're doing, not only with the battery chemistry and, and how they're looking at batteries, where they're sourcing their batteries from places that are politically stable, um, and the range that they're able to get. I mean, they're, they're what got made national headlines was when they drove from, from Novi, Michigan, and the Detroit suburbs all the way up into the UP and back on one charge. Yep. You know, I think there's an EV myth out there that uh, folks that have never driven one um, think, you know, oh, I got, I'm going to spend as much as I spend right now on gasoline on a charge. I'm going to spend 70, 80 bucks. The truth is, no, you're going to spend. You, I mean, you know, it's like seven to 12, 13, 14 bucks. Yeah, to fill up my EV every for night a for a range that's going to be equivalent to what you know and more to to what people are paying today for their their internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, and and so when you begin to see that that sort of technology innovation happening here. That, I mean, this generation's potential, Thomas Edison potentially, like, yeah. choosing Michigan. Majib's a genius. Um, and Arnex Energy is a really exciting company. And then you think about Flow Charging, the largest Canadian infrastructure, uh, charging infrastructure company. Ha they can go anywhere in the world, but they saw the manufacturing prowess that we had here. Um, not, not just our automotive prowess, but frankly, the infrastructure engineers here. Yeah, um, the talent. The, the hardware that they were able to source affordably and effectively with, with great quality. Um, Michigan with the natural choice, the talent, they want to hire up to 700 people working on charging infrastructure. That's great. It's awesome. Um, and then Via, I mean, that's a company, again, that could have went anywhere, but you're seeing a trend. You saw it with Rivian when they were in Florida and they moved to Michigan. And you're seeing it now with Via. As things become more serious in this business, you, you realize how many times you're booking your airplane ticket to Detroit to come up and figure stuff out. Exactly. Sometimes it just makes sense to be here. And the, the thing is, once these companies scale, do we have the scale mechanisms? Do we have the right talent where you can you can frankly hire 500 people if you need to in a matter of you know months to high tech talent to get where you need to go uh, with your company and and that's something that we're thinking about every day when these emerging companies choose us for a period of time like how can we make them stay the here and the now for me is very much about medium and heavy duty truck and I mean, if we want to be a carbon neutral state by 2050 which is what governor whitmer wants to do we need to start there and then we need to make sure that we have the appropriate EV adoption tools. So right now the governor has on the table a rebate uh, that would provide $2,500, uh, $2,000 for the vehicle and $500 for charging. 
We think that's a perfect complement to what the feds offer, which is at 7,500. So essentially, you know, in Michigan, if you want to buy an EV, you can get 10,000 back for doing it. Wow. Um, but then, you know, you think about agriculture and off-road equipment, like your airport, like helping Delta Airlines flip their fleet. Uh, when, when I say fleet, I mean all the obscure vehicles that you see moving your bags and everything else that is needed to, to have a plane take off. So we, we can't just stop at what's on road. We can't just stop at, at sort of consumer vehicles. I mean, this is really a whole of government, a whole of society approach that we have to take. I agree. And so to that point, is there anything that the state is doing as far as you know, supporting uh, like the e-bike or smaller micro mobility solutions yeah. that are electric? Yeah, so we, we have a program called the Michigan Mobility Funding Platform and essentially it goes around the state and inventories challenges that communities have. And a lot of those are micro mobility challenges. Um, and, and then we ultimately will offer dollars to, to launch a, a pilot, um, some technology deployment that has a sustainability plan because the worst thing you can do is put something in a community, a microbiology solution. People have it now in their routine and they use it and then you pull it out yeah. like eight months later, 10 months later, two years later. Um, and so we work with industry on that. And it's like my favorite grant program because right now, this is how government should work. So for every dollar we're putting down in a grant program, we're getting over a thousand dollars back from industry and other partners to support the sustainability of these deployments. And so we have them all over the state. Now they're not all for e-bikes, um, sure. but we do have a few. Uh, we did just, frankly, in Detroit, we did one recently with MoGo, uh, a new sort of e-bike hub for them um, to sort of create, begin to create that town square when you, you know, drop off and pick up your e-bike. Um, I think sometimes people, especially now with scooters everywhere and being so prevalent, I mean, people are, it, it can create a little bit of confusion and uncertainty whether you just should walk down the street and hopefully you'll see a scooter like tucked in a corner that's been dropped because someone else was just using it or sometimes you'll see them stacked against a light pole. Like there's not sort of this organized way to pick up your micro mobility mode. And so the idea, the bigger idea with, with that uh, MoGo investment was like, how can we organize this process to make it more inviting? And, and that's, that's a big deal. And then, you know, working with cities on, you know, thinking about their, their roads and the degree at which, because I think our roads are originally designed to put vehicles first and people second. Yes. <laughs> and, and is there a way to create portions of that road that do put people first and, and vehicles second? Uh, Detroit's been a leader in this space. If you go down like Cass Avenue, for example, Ann Arbor, um, Grand Rapids is getting there, but how do we get that thinking, that re restriping sort of approach uh, out in a way where you know, you, it's, it's a lot easier to see yourself on an e-bike because you know the routes. The routes are easy and clear and well-lighted and safe. There's things along them. Um, we need to start there in, in a place like Detroit because bikes aren't naturally where yeah. we go when we think of transportation, <laughs> exactly. but it can be. Yeah, and it's kind of exciting to see what's happening even on, in Corktown because yeah. Ford's doing a lot of innovation there and hopefully that hub yes. is going to be able to support not only... There'll be a whole new micromobility exchange there. It'll be right? one of the few new builds uh, because what they're doing, that, that's a 1.2 million square foot campus. It's not just the train station, uh, but, but it's going to be really taking infrastructure that was from the boom days of like the 40s and 50s and, and re, repurposing it, but then you're right, the micromobility exchange will be one of the few state-of-the-art things that is, is built from the, the ground up. Yeah, so it seems to me that, you know, our state, although we might just seem like we're the motor city and mm -hmm. we're our heritage so, uh, yeah. surrounds around the automobile, it's pretty exciting to see all the things that are taking place that, that people might not even know yeah. of that in this state we, that we this stuff's happening. That, I mean, it's important to cluster efforts. Um, I mean, I think it's important from a perspective of, you know, making sure that the first investment you make, there's some returns and the second and first investment can then create multiple returns. And so, you know, Corktown Detroit's one we really feel bullish about becoming this global mobility hub. So you have the Michigan Central Station development, which will uh, ideally uh, house 5,000 high-tech talent workers and bring mobility companies from all over the world, EV, hydrogen, um, uh, you name it, cybersecurity, all of them cluster together, not just small companies, but some of the biggest companies in the world. Then you have the, the Cavenue Corridor, which will be actually a custom-built road for autonomous vehicles uh, that will have you know, electrification components on it. And then you also have right in that district um, the first mile of road in the country that will actually charge an electric vehicle as it's in motion, which is a great solution for delivery vans, uh, transit vehicles, um, and we, we actually just signed a, an agreement with Electra on the company we're doing this with because they have roads in Sweden, Israel to um, look at other systems like, for instance, industry parks and 
um, you know, college campuses, areas where you could install uh, this technology, these pads that could charge these vehicles. And over time, if the vehicles are taking the same route, it can, it can really, really help productivity, can help costs. I mean, it's really cool technology. That's very interesting. It's exciting to see so many things go on at once. And the collaboration is important because yes. that's how we can all move forward in an efficient way to get this deployed. So that's pretty cool. So to that point, you got to charge an EV when you're on the road. Yeah. And I feel like there are a lot of Midwesterners that are specifically a little bit hesitant to adopt that EV lifestyle just because they're a little nervous that the charging infrastructure yeah. cannot support them. So can you explain the deployment of the NEVI program? So that's the sure. National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program that's going to be put into place. Can you give us some background on, you know, what is that program and how is it being implemented here in the state yeah. of Michigan? So uh, EV range anxiety is a thing, as you would know, uh, racing across the, the country. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so it, it really, I mean, it's part of the, the larger Biden infrastructure plan. Um, and in some ways it's been understated, but there's $7.5 billion that's gonna go into a national charging network. And Michigan received 110 million of it. And um, there are, as you might imagine, there are certain ways to distribute those funds and install stations. Um, and so you have to essentially nominate corridors. Um, and for us, it made a ton of sense to start in our interstates. Because anyone who's worried about, for instance, driving an electric vehicle up north, you're probably gonna take an interstate and there's probably gonna be not too many chargers on them at this very moment. And so we felt if we started there, and we our corridors include all the major interstates and even even you know roads in the UP, uh, that that's a good place to start. And so our plan was approved this summer uh, by by the the folks in DC, and and now we're to the point where we are working together. And and so it's really interesting with Nevi, right? Um, because in state government, the the structures that we have to govern are like more than a half century old. Yeah. I mean I mean they're from the, the first half of the 20th century. And uh, what we're being asked to take 20, 21st century technology that does not abide by those abide by the same structures exactly. and, and make it work is in, an, in an urgent fashion. And I've been really proud to see how state government has come together because really you have our procurement or our Department of Technology Man Management and Budget, which is its own thing, focused on, on purchasing chargers. You have our uh, MDOT, our Department of Transportation, who's gonna own the land um, and, and is gonna receive those, those federal funds. They're, they've never focused on electrification, now they very much will. And then you have our Department of Energy, or we call it the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy here in Michigan, that runs our charge-up program and the installation and the management. And then you have my office that's focusing on the larger strategy and how it ties into mobility and economic development. And all those different, yeah. that spaghetti bowl of acronyms needs to work together, and we've done it in a matter of weeks, figure out a way to do that. Okay, so this mode of transportation that I wanna talk about has to deal with uh, the children. So they are gonna be getting to school on school buses that are electrified in the future, yeah. is that right? That's correct. This week, uh, we, we announced 138 new uh, e-school buses across uh, 25 different districts around the state. And not wow. just like Detroit area, like all over the state and all types of school districts. Um, you know, the truth is, in, in beyond just being so much better for the, for the planet, um, you actually, with an electric bus versus a, a diesel bus, can save $6,000 per seat. Over, and over the life of the vehicle, a district can save over $230,000, say the, the school bus ends up being, I think wow. they last about 14 years. Um, so it's as much about economics as, as fighting climate change and, and frankly, like removing situations where you know, we have harmful emissions with you know, kindergartners every single day for a semester. Like that's just unacceptable. And again, this is, in this generation, we first time in history, we have the technology to do something about that. What's cool though, is that this school bus is like the perfect use case for this. I feel like yeah. it's one of the spaces that should go electric first because yeah. it's a fixed, predictable route. You're going for a certain period of time to go pick up the kids and then you can put it right on the charger overnight and then go back out on the route for the afternoon or for the uh, morning. So it's a perfect mm -hmm. use case for electric mobility. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. So, I mean, if you think about even the energy storage uh, opportunities. And so with school districts, we use them as our voting precincts. We use them uh, as our athletic venues. Um, we use them for all sorts of things. Why don't we use them as our power plants? And that can be a revenue generator for some, some districts that have struggled in the past with margins. Um, things like getting state-of-the-art school supplies. And you can do that by taking, taking the buses and, and 
leveraging them in a sort of a vehicle to grid uh, integration capacity where let's say, you know, in a, in a crisis situation, the grid goes down, a school bus can drive over and power something that needs powering um, and, and do it in a way where it's not unsafe for kids um, to have this technology on the bus with them every day. I mean, that's all possible. Um, there's just so many aspects of electric school buses that get me excited about the future of electrification. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, I'm very grateful for you have taken the opportunity to sit down I'm and chat for with you. me. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was, this was great. a lot of fun. Now, I like to tell stories that are kind of normalizing electrification and having great conversations like this. So who do you think I should talk to next and what story should I tell? I mean, I have like a whole list of people, like just all this data, like just fire hose full of data of people that you should talk to. Okay. There's so many people that are, are, are fired up like I am about electrification. What I will tell you though, I think some of the most intriguing conversations will be with those that haven't as much thought about electrification up until this past year, because sure. it's been in the headlines more and more and more every day, um, and, and get a sense of where they'd like to see their business go. There's a lot of tough questions around public-private um, negotiations of where these chargers go. There are city ordinances where you're limited on how many chargers you can have in a parking lot, uh, depending on how big your, your building is. What about multi-unit dwellings? How does that all work? Um, how are developers, how are parking garages, how is it all gonna fit into the grid? Um, so maybe it's not as much about the stories as it is like all the questions that needs answering that you can help inventory and then we can all tackle together. I agree. I'm, yeah. I'm up for that challenge. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for watching this latest video. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, drive, fly, ride, go electric. <laughs>